words, the child's rights should not be dependent on the citizenship of their parent. The second argument we'd like to make on our side of the house today is why we believe this is good public policy. First of all, we believe it improves the quality of schools. We see that there's a feedback problem which affects the children of immigrants. Their, children tend to be, their parents tend to be less vocal. They tend to have cultural problems which prevent them or discourage them from becoming very involved in the operation of their schools. They tend to be less confrontational with administration, less likely to communicate their problems or communicate their needs. And only they tend to be less likely to be involved in things such as parent-teacher associations. As a result, we have a feedback problem. Recognizing that it's hard for immigrants who have limited resources to flock to the private schools, we don't have any type of market mechanism or democratic mechanism to determine what the needs or what the desires of these families are. By instituting the right to vote, we get that type of feedback which allows us to improve the quality of these schools. Only we allow these individuals the opportunity to express their wishes, express, express their wishes, express what's important to them. Yes. I don't know much about school board elections because they don't impact my life. Uh, but you're not taking people's names when they're voting, right? You don't know what their view is. You're not getting their feedback unless they say, hi, I'm like, like Justin Berkowitz, immigrant from country A, and this is our opinion, right? How are you getting their feedback? It's an anonymous vote. If they have votes, they have influence over the candidates that are elected. <laughs> candidates will be more likely to accommodate these people if they believe they have political power and adjust their political views or how they're going to operate the school board in order to achieve the vote or request. Uh, get the votes of these particular individuals. It's the same way that any type of election works. <laughs> the second argument like think, beyond feedback is that we believe in particular these students need some kind of say or need influence in this process because they usually do have special needs. First of all, we see that cultural differences make it very difficult for these types of students to integrate and operate successfully within the education system of the United States. In many countries, we see that it's very unusual for a child to ask questions <coughs> of their teacher or be vocal in class or participate in group projects. There's authority structures which are much different than the way we operate in the United States. And we furthermore see that the types of extracurriculars that these children want to be in, or the types of language needs that they have, the special education, education classes that they need, or the way that they approach mathematics, are much different than we do in Western societies. And that if individuals are going to be able to successfully adjust to the American education system, be successfully educated, then it's in our interest to hear back from them and help me give these groups and these, uh, these children uh, political power in these, problem, in these issues. But furthermore, we say it's important to give them political power because many of these children either are citizens or will be citizens. So it's in our interest to ensure that their education is as good as possible, yeah. just as it's good in our interest to ensure that any other child in the education system yeah. has some kind of representation or some kind of input into how their education occurs. As a result, we say that it's in the United States' interest, even if you don't believe there's a right to vote for these immigrant parents, we think it's good public policy to do so. But furthermore, we think that ultimately reducing the difficulties of educating these children reduces the behavioral problems which are often associated with them. When an individual is more likely, more easily adjust to the educational climate which exists, when accommodations are made for them, when they find the, the schools more receptive of their needs, ultimately these individuals are more likely to integrate, and we think that's an important function of the public education system, to integrate individuals into a wider community. Ultimately, the best way to do that is to make their transition as easy as possible. The third argument we want to make today, and only the second argument why I believe it's good public policy, is we ultimately this provides the training wheels for democracy. Ultimately, it's a good way of symbolically inviting immigrants who are non-citizens into the democratic community which exists in the United States and preparing them, preparing them over the long foot for citizenship. First of all, we say that it's symbolically important because often immigrants feel unwelcome. They don't feel part of larger, largely white American community. We think giving them a vote sends a positive message to them and encourages them to get involved in other types of neighborhood associations or in the act of get active in the education of their children. But furthermore, it encourages them to be informed on these issues, to look at politics as something to which they can participate and not something which largely belongs to white regions of the United States or to, uh, citizens of the United States. We think these things are all important because they encourage people to pursue citizenship over the long term, just so that they can make a positive contribution and see the effects of that contribution on their child's education on some type of government that's in their community. We think only proposing, promoting democracy in small steps in this way is the best way to encourage these individuals to, over the long term, become sufficiently well committed to the interests of the United States, and thus only promote these individuals to seek citizenship and become full members of the American community. Therefore, because we believe there's a right to vote, because this is good public policy, we better propose. Thank you, Prime Minister. And call upon the leader of the opposition to deliver an eight minute speech deconstructing the government's. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Everyone on this panel, everyone in this sort of august house. Of course, your friends on my government for an interesting case, and Justin for a fantastic emo just a few minutes' time. The first thing I'm going to point out is this case is, I'm not going to call it tight, but like the way in which they frame it makes it sound a little shady for us to comment at all, right? Because they say, you know, right now people have kids in school, and we're 
about giving their parents any say in how the school is run. So the school can be really bad to them. The school can really screw them over. <laughs> Clearly, we're not trying to defend on our side of the house that you shouldn't just totally fuck over the children of immigrants or people who are children whose parents just don't have the ability to vote. Clearly, we're not defending that on our side of the house. <laughs> like, that's ridiculous. I think a better way to frame this round and what the actual debate is, is does a school district or does a state have the right to set limits on whether these people are able to vote in school elections and is it in their interest to do so? So it's not a question of should the parents have some kind of say over their children. They clearly have custody over their children. They clearly have some say over their rights. The question is should we be able to deny this voting right to these people and is it particularly societally advantageous for us to do so? So the first question I'm going to ask is just that. Do we have a right to deny this? And I think that we definitely do. Because understand that we do recognize in the United States differential rights and privileges for citizens and resident aliens. The argument they make that because their children are impacted by this policy, they should have a right to set it, could apply to any other sector of the economy here, 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 or any other sector of policy. Understand it could apply to people who don't even live in this country, given that American foreign policy and even American domestic policy is particularly impactful throughout the world, but it certainly applies to anyone who lives in this country, right? The laws about murder, the laws about owning a business, the laws about anything else also impact these people directly, not even through a proxy, through their children. So at that point, if the mere fact that they are impacted by a policy is enough to give them voting rights, what they're really trying to defend is give these people voting rights. I don't think that's legitimate. No, I'll take you on case, but not right now. So what we're going to say on our side of the house is that firstly, the fact that you are not as committed to entering this country, that you are not as committed to our welfare in general, is a reason that we should deny you the right to vote on any policy decision. It's not necessarily that we're going to try to screw you over. It's not necessarily that we're not going to be willing your best interest, but we're going to recognize that this is our country, not the country of the resident aliens, that citizens do have higher obligations and should be rewarded for having sought those higher obligations. That's the second thing that I want to talk about is incentives to become citizens. Because quite honestly, if you want to look at the difference between being a resident alien and a citizen, being a resident alien isn't so bad. You don't have to serve in the military necessarily. I don't think you can even be called for jury duty. It's not really clear necessarily that it's that much better to be a citizen. But if people are going to be in this country for the long haul, we want them to be citizens. Mm -hmm. We don't want them just to be resident aliens who may have allegiances to other countries. We want them to actually make a firm commitment to the United States. And telling them that the only way that you can vote, the only way in which you can shape this country in a permanent way is to become a citizen, I think, sends a powerful message. That doesn't mean that you should try to blackmail, their, blackmail them with their children or like totally screw over their kids, but if they do really want a personal say in the matter, they should take that additional step to become citizens. No, I told you I'd take you on the case, but not that. The third thing I want to talk about, though, is how this could potentially distort politics in a way which citizens should have the right to defend against. Because they tell you on their side of the house these people often have special needs. Perhaps they might want bilingual education. Perhaps the parents might want property taxes raised if they don't particularly own property in the region. A lot of resident, I mean, it's not like resident aliens are the principal property holders in the United States, but given that school taxes are founded largely by are funded largely by property taxes, they may have different concerns which aren't those necessarily of the community. Now that doesn't mean they're not willing their children's best interest, but the issue is are they willing the best interest of the total school community? Here, here. And if they're not willing the best interest of the school community, if they are just willing their own personal best interest, I think the school community, because they are citizens, does have a right to prevent them from doing that, does have the right from taking programs away from like art and music to fund bilingual education. No thanks. So with that said, let's go quickly here back to case. The first thing that we say is that they say is that Look, the reason we don't let these people vote in state elections is because they're not committed to the well-being of the United States. But we let them vote in school elections because they are committed to the well-being of the school. As I said before, they are committed to their children's personal well-being, but there's no reason to believe they are committed to the well-being of the American educational system. At the point at which they are not necessarily committed to the well-being of the school as a whole, to the other children, and because they have no reason, they have no reason to believe that. They're not citizens. They've made no particular commitment. I think at that point they shouldn't have a right to set policy for all children. Certainly Certainly they have custody over their children and they can decide what their children do. They can put them in a private school if they want, but that doesn't mean they get to set the policy for the rest of the people, not in this country, unless they make a commitment. Sure. They're going to want to make sure that their child receives the best education possible. How is that any different as a motivation than any other white or citizen in the region? <laughs> Because the citizens, I mean, you can also argue that American citizens don't have the best interest of the United States in mind. Here, here. But what we're arguing is that the reason that we do give them a right to vote isn't purely because they have an interest, because everyone has an interest. That's not possibly a reason to grant people voting rights. It's because they've made a commitment to the well-being of the country by being a citizen. Here, here. These people haven't made that commitment. 
Maybe it's true that they won't be any more greedy than an American, but at the point at which the American, by being a citizen, has tacitly made a concession that he will will the best interests of the United States, even if he doesn't do it in all cases, I think at that point that we can hold them to a higher standard, and we can necessarily like deny this particular right to these people. And I don't think there is a real distinction between these state issues and in the child issues, and if they're only defending allowing them to vote in the school board elections, I think that they need to resolve this tension. The second thing they say is that it is a proxy for the rights of children who are citizens of the United States. You should care about the rights of those, citizens, of those children, and like, you should like, have the best policy for them. Firstly, we're not advocating bad education policy. All we're advocating on our side of the house is that these people should have no say in shaping education policy. I think it's their burden to prove that when you don't have their parents involved in this education policy, that you're always going to get worse education policy for it. I think that in the majority of cases, school boards are going to be willing the best interests of all children concerned. I think this case has desperately low impact if you want to look at the way in which school board elections are actually going to progress. So at that point, given that this case has desperately low impact, I think that sending the right message and the right incentives to these people, that if you want to have a role in shaping public policy in general for all of us, you should become a citizen. The third thing they say is that it encourages people to become involved in their schools. Like, maybe it does. If you were allowed, talking about letting them become school board members, clearly you'd be making an involvement in the schools. I don't think merely voting in an election is actually particularly impactful. Further, if they actually care about the welfare of their kids, they're probably going to become involved anyway. They haven't given you any reason to believe that like these people are unfit parents, because the fact that they can't vote means they don't care about their kids and they don't become involved. I think they're definitely going to become involved at the point at which they do care about their children, and they don't give you any reason to believe that this voting is going to give you some kind of differential impact, which is going to be positive. The fourth thing they talk about is how these people have special needs, there are cultural differences. But I think the problem here is that if they really do have these special needs which are endemic to this population, that means in school districts in which these people make up a majority of the population, that you can end up with them willing the interests of the minority, of the immigrant community specifically, rather than the interests of the citizens. And I think that in the United States, when it comes to a conflict of the rights and the obligations to your citizens versus the rights and obligations to non-citizen resident aliens, we have to side with the yeah. citizens. And at the point at which it is likely to occur, that you're likely to have to cancel an art and a music program to make bilingual education because education financing is that bad. At that point, you really do have to side with the citizens and give them a mechanism by which they can protect themselves by denying these people the right to vote. In addition, they say that this is going to prepare them for the, on the journey to democracy. Because by giving them this right to vote, they're going to get like, addicted to voting, and then they're going to become a citizen so they can vote on everything else. Firstly, if you buy their analysis that the fact that they have an interest in this country is a reason to give them voting rights, I don't know why they're not giving them all voting rights already, right? Like, set, let's set the journey off. But also what we say on our side of the house is that we actually prepare them for democracy in a better way if they really care that much about educational policy. And typically, most parents, while they care about the well-being of their kids, don't care that much about school board politics. Like, it's a very minor issue. At that point, if they really care that much, they can try to become a citizen. All we're saying is until you become a citizen and make a commitment to everyone, you can't shape policy for everyone. Here, for here. all these reasons, we have folks. before we go into all the arguments back and forth on the flow, or is the picture of voting and what justifies voting that comes out of side opposition. It seems though they say that voting isn't restricted when it's against societal interest or public interest, but voting should be restricted when these minority like legal immigrants will go against the will of other people. They seem to say that the reason we should restrict voting is because they have policies that are different from the people who already get to vote, and as a result, we shouldn't allow them to disagree with these people who already get to vote. What we explain to you is that voting is an intrinsic good, that there has to be a compelling state interest to restrict it, and that we have to have reason to believe that the people will not be voting with the best interests of society. Their response is simply, but they might disagree with the majority, but it's not as if the intrinsic goodness or badness of public policy depends on how it accords with the people who are to get to vote and what they desire. The goodness and badness of public policy should be decided in terms of how it fits the preferences of the people who are under the educational system, and insofar as we should err on the side of allowing voting, they need to explain to us why significant harms will arise from not letting them vote. 
So it's simply saying the harm is that they will disagree with the people in the community is a terrible argument. You see it come up even more when they say, well, listen, what if everybody were in the majority? Like all these legal immigrants were in the majority. Then they would be imposing their will upon everybody else. What this presupposes and what their entire opposition presupposes is that for some reason we should weight the preferences of people who are already citizens above those who aren't. That's why it would be wrong for the majority to get their will passed because, I mean, they're legal immigrants. Sure, they're like the people most affected by public policy, but I mean, come on, the people who have citizenship already disagree with them. Explain to me why I'm wrong. I'm just confused. If I heard you correctly, what you're saying is, it's wrong that we weight the interests and preferences of those people who are citizens over those who aren't. Would you like to offer argumentation why non-citizens should be treated the same as regular citizens in more context? Because I would love to hear that. Oh, it's here. <laughs> we actually explain this to you when we give you the standards that Rory gives you in the first point about how it is that we delineate. I wish you'd been paying attention. I was actually looking at Glunt. He did not flow our arguments. And we can explain to you why we can restrict access to voting in certain cases, such as state and federal elections, but not in school board or elections. Because in state and federal elections, we have no reason to believe they will be acting in the collective interest and in the collective whole. We know that they will care about educational systems. With that said, the first point is like, I know that yeah, this case sounds know. shady. It's tightish, I'm not going to call it tight, but what it's about is what case construct said it's about. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to address this in terms of where the existence of the right comes from and would it be good public policy. And somehow they admit that this is an open issue and that there are sources of normativity that we can ascribe to voting, but they then say like, I'm not going to call it tight. Listen, you either have to call it tight or you don't, but you should live and die by your tight call, not like imply, if you think it might be tight, I don't have to provide further arguments for why it is. Puts us in a really weird spot where we have to give arguments against ourselves to show why it's not tight, so that's why you have to actually take that stand upon yourself. So the first thing that they talk about is the right to deny it. And they say, listen, there's a difference between aliens and citizens. We agree that this is true, but it's true in the most trivial sense of the word. The difference between them is that citizens are automatically allowed to vote and non-citizens aren't. But they don't explain to you why this difference should matter in the realm of school board voting. They say, listen, children being affected is too broad because some people might be affected in like Australia by our murder laws. This is why we add the word sufficiently affected, right? <laughs> we think that there's a standard of affected where like, you on think, on that rat. point, you should have listened, sit down. Okay, <laughs> it's just like, we can say that the sufficient effect is, insofar as there is a 100% probability that the effects of an election on a school board will have effects on your life, whereas there is not a 100% probability that on an rat. effect on an election will have an effect on your, like, Iraq. On George Bush's decision in Iraq? Okay, you don't get to vote every single time that you think that your election might, that the election might have an effect on some country abroad. This is just like too vague and inconsistent of a standard. But the point is that if we want to have some consistent standard for when are you are sufficiently affected, it should be that your interests are automatically, by the nature of the voting, going to be affected by the result. It's an intrinsic nature of voting at school board levels. And if you really think that like sufficiently affected isn't the reason why we allow people to vote, I'd really like to hear why it is that we allow people. Now, with that said, they also say, like, listen, we're not trying to screw them over. We didn't say that the school boards are screwing them over. We said that they're not properly responsive. We're not saying currently school boards, like, torture these kids. We're just saying, like, they don't provide the proper ESL. So don't think it's, like, entirely because they're defending torturing kids in school. Then they say, listen, people have put in more if they're citizens. First of all, this is not necessarily substantiated because it could be that the re legal residents pay just as much taxes. But second of all, if they put in more, they also get more. They get to vote on other levels. But I don't understand why they haven't put, why they've put in more for the educational system. They've put in a kid and they've put in <laughs> one Like, what more have they put into the system? <laughs> the second issue is like, being a resident alien isn't so bad, so we want to incentivize uh, like, we want to incentivize voting. We explain you why we do incentivize voting, or like it's naturalization, but we also say like, listen, preventing them from voting when they have the right to do so in order to get them to naturalize is incredibly coercive. It's probably not worth restricting their rights to vote so that they can become citizens. That's a really messed up standard. Then the third point is like, special needs get special interests, but they don't explain why this is wrong insofar as these special interests are in the best interests of some kids. It's like, sure, the special interests might occasionally coincide with the majoritarian view, but that's perfectly acceptable. In fact, we'd say that it's always fine for people to pursue their own self-interest, despite the fact that other people might disagree. That's why we allow voting in the first place. You can't restrict anybody else's voting by saying, but all the other people who get to vote would disagree with you, and I don't understand why that's a reasonable standard here. So let's move the case on. The first point is they say, like, listen, in response to our first point, they say, why not expand it to all voting? And we explain to you why not. Because there's a sufficient level of effectiveness and a sufficient commitment to the success yeah. of the institution. It's that you have to have the educational system succeed because your kids are in it. And they seem no thank you to deposit that there's some like, notion of success independent of responsiveness to the needs of the kids. But 
But we say that's not true. It's not that the public institution of education is like some entity that would be worsened by letting these people vote in. We say that it should be judged based on how responsive it is. And more importantly, they don't explain to you why it would be bad for the educational system to let immigrants vote. So insofar as they're sufficiently committed and sufficiently affected, that's our standard. They're not sufficiently affected by federal elections if they can plan on leaving, but insofar as they can you know, be sufficiently affected by the educational system, that's fine. With that said, they also say, listen, they have not yet made a commitment. They haven't made the commitments of citizens. But I would challenge them, have any citizens really made the commitments they're talking about? My parents were American citizens when I was born. Most of you guys were born on American land. We've paid taxes, but at what point do we say, like, we're willing to take upon ourselves this commitment of citizenship? It's not an actual commitment that has been taken upon ourselves. In fact, we'd say the only time it's ever made is naturalization. But more importantly, we'd say, listen, what if these parents are trying to make this concession, but it takes 14 years of legal residence to naturalize? In the meantime, like, they want to make this concession, but they can't. No, thank you. You're now officially out of order. <laughs> so, as a result, what we're going to say is like, listen, all it means is you were born here, and insofar as they say, like, you've made the commitment, but they don't explain what the nature of this commitment is that hasn't also been made by legal residents that entitles you to the right to vote, why is this a unique argument for their side? We say legal residents make commitments to the society as well, to the educational system. They make commitments every bit as much, and none of us have ever actually made this commitment. <laughs> then they say, listen, in response to our second poll, Point. They say, we're not advocating bad policy. We know they're not. But pa bad policy exists, and they're advocating a means of preventing it from being changed. They're not advocating the bad policy. They're just advocating the kind of political institution that will freeze the badness of this policy. So I'm sorry, you do have to bite that bullet. Then they say, why will it get better? This has got to be low impact. I mean, if you're willing to vote, you must be willing to go to PTA meetings and talk to teachers all the time. No, I don't understand why this level of commitment and willingness to vote in any way, shape, or form indicates that like, if they were already willing to help their kids, they'd be doing so through these other means anyway, so they don't need to vote. The fact is, voting is a particularly efficient, particularly effective way of getting what they want across, and that some people who might not feel so comfortable challenging the principal or challenging their teacher or protesting in favor of ESL rights might feel a little more comfortable voting. Their third point is like they just say, like, listen, it's probably not too impactful. The impactful, and we've already addressed this, he just constantly reiterates it. In response to the last point, he says, people won't magically get addicted to voting. Congratulations on the straw man. We actually said that voting is like an addictive substance that when you push, you get addicted to. No. Once you see the benefits of voting, and once you see the benefits of citizenship, you have more reason to get those benefits in other areas, and that's the incentive. We're practical. Okay. Thank you. I thank the member of government and call upon members of the opposition to deliver the final constructive speech for the round of Mr. Speaker and everyone else. Okay, uh, I know you guys are probably very tired from being up late last night worrying about school board elections. Legal aliens were allowed to vote. <laughs> I also didn't know these guys transferred to Harvard. Okay. Uh, is it Harvard? K -S -S That's what I'm what? saying. What? It's not. <laughs> First of all, I want to talk about this like very strange confusion that seems to go on in Ariel's speech, where he said not one, not two, but three standards for why we allow people to vote and what our goals are. Here are the ones I counted. First, he says these guys have to show a compelling state interest to restrict it. Now, I haven't gone to law school yet, but I know that's legal terminology. And I'm sure as fuck that that does not get applied to vote here, here. Voting is not that easy, right? You don't have to show a compelling state interest to restrict it. That's for, like, eminent domain, where it's superseding other rights. If they could have proven a natural right to voting sometime in their earlier speeches, maybe we would need to show a compelling state interest. But I don't think we need to do that. Okay, that's the first thing. Then, what are some of the other cool standards we get? Well, here's one that comes. This is a direct quote. You know, the reason we don't let them vote in federal elections is because we have no reason to, to believe that they care about the collective interest. I think that's the argument that Robert made. That was the one that they dropped because they didn't understand it, but this is particularly important too. Well, wait a minute. Now we have to determine if they care about the collective interest? Rob said they might vote for things like bilingual education. When Ariel was busy strawmanning his argument, saying that, uh-oh, they might go against the majority, the argument he was misunderstanding is that there are a lot of cases where legal aliens are more likely to have views that are not in the collective interests of a school district. <laughs> what are some examples? I hear that bilingual education is a contentious issue in California. That's not a reason to allow them not to vote, but at the point at which most people don't want it, I don't think it's in their collective interest if it only benefits a small number of people, whereas something like art or music or science would benefit a much bigger number. That would probably be in their collective interest. That's just using Ariel's standards, so I believe we went on that moment. Sure. You really believe it's not in the collective interest of an that people don't have a commitment to the collective interest of an educational system that will affect the lives of their children? 
First of all, no, I don't. I went to a school that had a very large number of legal aliens and a large number of illegal aliens. Many of them were not particularly interested in the welfare of the school or like the collective interest. But also, Rob tells you there are other ways people can get involved. And while these guys are like, you know, it's a lot easier to vote than it is to like go to PTA meetings, you're also not getting a particular view across in voting. Why is this the case? Because if they don't address bilingual education in the school board campaign, no one has any idea that you care about it. But also, because these groups are often extreme minorities in society, you have no idea whether they or not they overwhelmingly voted for one candidate or another on the basis of a particular issue. You can't use voting to gauge it. That's why I asked the question earlier on if we're going to be having getting their names beforehand, because these are such small people, here, here. it's not like these school board elections come out with some type of mandate afterwards. That's kind of absurd. Here, here. So first, Rob talks about the government having a right to deny. They give different rights and privileges to legal aliens all the time. This is no different than something like federal elections. He also explains that the fact that the policy impacts them is not enough. I think Schneller stepped right into a Vietnamese or North Korean minefield here. And he starts <laughs> making the argument that, well, wait, wait a minute, wait, if the policy impacts them, you know, they should be able to vote. This policy impacts their kids. Yeah, some policies impact their kids, but also, you know what? School boards don't do that much that's that different from school board to school board. So I don't think it's going to have a huge impact on their kids. But even if it does, the people who are in Iraq when George Bush is running on the platform of continue kicking the shit out of Iraq definitely have a huge <laughs> policy interest in that outcome. And although it would be absurd to allow Iraqis to vote in the United States election, I think it exemplifies why this is a silly standard for why people should be allowed to vote. Uh, here, here. Okay. No. Another thing, though, that I want to talk about, and I think that this is particularly important, is what happens as a result of this type of thing. Because we talked about how it distorted politics a little bit later in Rob's argumentation. Rob referred to bilingual education, but I would also point to different state values on things like church and state. Because a lot of immigrants and people who are not of American-like origin or American citizens don't understand the dichotomy between yeah, church and yeah. state in the United States. That would give them an incentive in some very important, very charged issues to vote differently on particular things. I think a citizen does have an innate understanding of things like church and state separation, like teaching evolution in schools or not teaching evolution in schools, that is a more nuanced view not always available to these types of people. Is this a guarantee? Absolutely not. But under their standard, we just have to show that they may not always be acting in the collective interest of people, and I think that that's reasonable. But the other thing that I'd say is that you wind up heavily racializing elections. Why is this the case? Well, they tell us that it's more likely that, that uh, like people who are running for school board now have to reach out to these people. I don't see why they can't have a poll or an open forum and try and find out what they're thinking that way and find out that there's like a really big call among the legal alien community for something. I'll get to you in a second. But what you do wind up doing is what we have in federal elections, are you getting the black vote or are you getting the now immigrant vote as they become a particular enclave? This is not the case on our side of the house because you don't do that. Why is this bad? Because it puts communities in a situation where there are actual divisions in them. As opposed to having immigrants actually wind up being assimilated and mixing in with the community, they're now addressed as a particular enclave, as a separate entity within that community. Sure. The reason you can't have an open forum is because no candidate for the school board would give a shit, but a community that doesn't vote for his position cares. That's why. Okay, so until the immigrants are the majority of the community, their votes, or plurality, their votes are not going to have a huge impact on who wins, and they still won't care. That's very silly. No, thank you. In fact, for most of these communities where it's like one or two people, I don't think that they're going to have a big impact on these things. That's sort of dumb. Okay, so we talk about all these kinds of stuff. The other thing, though, that I think is important and relevant here is that a lot of schools are funded from federal block grants. This is important because this is a policy that very much affects them, and these guys don't advocate allowing these people to, to vote in federal elections. Under their logic, even if it's just tied to schools, they would have to be able to at least vote for state legislators who allocate school funding on a statewide basis. So that's relevant, too. Let's turn to case where they make dumb arguments. Actually, they make <laughs> dumb arguments on both sides, but let's go to case. So the first one is they say that they're not committed to the well-being of the United States. That's an assertion. Uh, but they are committed to the well-being of schools. Another safari to assertion country. <laughs> what we've said is, number one, there's an enormous amount of overlap. See the argument I, I said about block grants, but also just like foreign policy can be hugely effective for people. We have no reason to believe any of this is true. So that's a problem. The other thing is like the examples that I, I gave with their interests being very much divergent with those of the United States citizens. So I think that's a problem too. They also said this is a proxy for the rights of ch children. Okay, here's the thing. This assumes that kitty voting is okay. Why? Because uh, under what they're saying, and I think this is like sort of silly, they're not proxying for a child. It's not like, you know, were their child like, like a citizen, they'd be allowed to vote or something like that. So I think it's kind of dumb for them to say that they're just going to vote on their child's behalf that all of a sudden they have an innate right to vote because their kid is a citizen. What else do we see? Well, let me get into the argument here that they're like, you know, these people are like not really very well involved, and they've made a lot of, I think, very assertive arguments about why they're not going to get involved in community forums, why they wouldn't get involved in taking a mail poll or something like that, and now they tell us that the politicians won't care. Well, why is this a problem for them? 
The way I see it, there are a number of possible outcomes, and this is sort of expanding on what Robert argued um, in response to this. They would have to show you an example of a case where there's a huge number of legal aliens who are ignored, like nobody pays attention.